The host has a recording feature on. We're good. All right. Well, a happy 2018 to everyone. My name is Marshall Summer. I work with uh, Deb here at Children's National Medical Center in the Rare Disease Institute. I guess this is our kickoff 2018 lecture. Um, Deb has asked me to talk about basically what rare diseases can teach us about more common ones. And the concept I'd like to kind of share with you, I'm assuming you all can all see my slides. Um, first the host off, has the recording feature on. First off, there's a uh, teaser on the very first slide. You'll notice the watermelons in the background. That's actually a teaser for the answer, um, which we'll give at the end of it. So that'll hopefully keep you on the call for a while. So this slide is talking about the concept of environmentally determined genetic expression. And what the heck does that mean? Well, that means that, and if you see my mouse cursor here, you'll see it kind of circling around this line down here. Any phenotype, whether it's pulmonary hypertension or just take your pick, all different kinds of things, has typically two components to it. One is a genetic component and the other is an environmental component. So if I give you an extra chromosome 21, the genetic component on that is so strong it doesn't matter what the environment is, you're going to have Down syndrome. If I'm sitting at the base of a nuclear blast, which I realize is a bad uh, joke this time of year, um, then I'm going to pretty much get fried no matter what my genetics uh, tell me. And if you look closely at the uh, mushroom cloud there, you'll see the face of a clown in it. So that's kind of the concept. So by uh, different extremes, we can get to those things without the other axis. But most people live in the middle. Mild genetic changes interact with the environment, and that's what gives us a lot of different disease models. Now, given the sophistication of genetics that we have now, for mild genetic changes, not the rare ones, but the mild ones, we actually have to make the environment a little more extreme before we'll see manifestation. So, and I'll, I'll describe some of those scenarios to you later, but it kind of makes sense. You know, that just kind of raises the bar when you've got a milder change. So, let's talk about the urea cycle. It's after lunch, at least here in Washington, D.C., so nothing to put you to sleep like a picture of a biochemical pathway. The urea cycle is your primary way for clearing waste nitrogen, um, but it does more than that. So if you go back to 1923, this is a drawing similar to what you would have seen in Hans Krebs' original description. It's kind of flat, kind of boring. Uh, those of you who did first year biochemistry are kind of going, oh, dear God, it's back. But actually, let's think about this a little bit, and let's take a look at this drawing here. So this is what this looks like in the liver. So one of the things we kind of did, and I'll show you on the next slide, is we actually went to a bunch of tissues and then looked at the uh, enzyme levels for different enzymes in all the different tissues. And the thickness of these arrows actually reflects how much of that enzyme is in each tissue. So let's take a look at this one here. So in the liver, the urea cycle has all of the enzymes all the way down to making urea. It's a detoxification pathway. Uh, it does pretty much what you'd expect. It takes ammonia and nitrogen out of glutamine and takes it all the way through this path. It has a rate limiting enzyme up here in the left hand corner, good old CPS1. It's an enzyme I've spent a lot of years working on. And that actually kind of determines flow through the rest of the pathway. So if you put ammonia or nitrogen into this path in the liver, you get urea out of it, not much else. Now, if we go to the small intestine and gut, we do the same experiment looking at how much enzyme there is. And believe it or not, this will all come back to tell us how a rare disease can inform us about a common one. So just bear with me for a bit. If we now um, go to the gut, we actually find that we've got lots of enzyme all the way through the last step. And then the last step for arginase down there, there's almost none. So what on earth is this doing? Well, as it turns out, if you measure the blood flow coming out of the gut, you actually see very large amounts of both citrulline and arginine. So the purpose here is actually biosynthetic. So you've got to have arginine. Without this production, arginine becomes an essential amino acid. And as you'll see later in the talk here, citrulline ends up being a very important precursor molecule for a number of other things. Now, before I go into the next one, I'm going to point out something. Uh, in the early um, 1990s, uh, Fred Murad and a bunch of other guys started talking about nitric oxide, which is a short-acting gas made in vascular endothelial cells and elsewhere um, that is made actually by converting arginine into citrulline, releasing nitric oxide. And it's actually a little loop pathway here. 
There's not much of that going on in the small intestine. There's a little bit from the inducible nitric oxide synthase, but keep this one in mind because we're going to come back to it later on. Now, if we go to the lung, we actually see that we're no longer actually producing citrulline and arginine for export. In fact, we don't even have the top part of the pathway here. CPS and OTC are pretty much absent in the lung, even though there's plenty of them in the gut and liver. But we've got lots of these enzymes in this intermediate cycle. Uh, arginosuccinic acid synthase, the enzyme with the unfortunate acronym, arginosuccinic acid lyse, and then endothelial nit um, neuronal and inducible nitric oxide synthase. And these actually are present in pretty good quantities, particularly in the vascular endothelium in the lung, and one of their jobs is to make nitric oxide for vasodilation. Now, that's three different um, uses for the urea cycle. Um, that's a detox system, it's a biosynthetic pathway, and it's a signaling pathway. These are all from the same genes, and it gets, if there, for those of you who are aficionados of gene regulation, there's a lot of kind of cool things that go on in the um, five prime untranslated regions of these genes. We'll say that for another day. So as you can imagine, if you mess with this pathway, you're going to have a lot of different effects. So what things do disrupt this pathway? Well, let's come back to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So sex is genetics. Uh, rare genetic defects have been described for every enzyme and transporter in this pathway. Um, genetic defects in liver structure, such as Wilson's disease, tyrosinemia, things that toxic uh, from a tox standpoint or from a structural interfere with blood flow to the liver, and then the other inborn errors of metabolism, which tyrosinemia is one I realize, but like the organic acidemias, which can interfere with that first enzyme, CPS1. So there's lots of ways to interfere with it here. It's a very cumbersome biochemical pathway, so it's actually easily affected. From the drug standpoint, there's a number of commonly used medications that can interfere with this. The seizure medication valproic acid will actually directly interfere with the function of the first enzyme, carbamyl phosphate synthetase, and cause decreased flow through the rest of the cycle. High-dose chemotherapy, cyclophosphamide particularly, um, that's often used in high doses in bone marrow transplant, will interfere also with the first enzymes in the pathway. And then you can get what I call overall liver damage. So for instance, if you take an overdose of acetaminophen and resulting in massive liver damage, by having those hepatocytes dysfunctional, you'll have an acquired urea cycle defect. And then rock and roll is my category for life and environmental damage to the liver and gut. There are obviously different viruses, the different hepatitises and others, uh, neonatal herpes infections in the liver give you just massive tox to the liver. Chemicals, um, short-term and long-term ethanol damage to the liver, particularly with cirrhosis, things like that. Uh, also, there are certain um, dry cleaning chemicals will also do that as well. Hypoxia and shock, so if you deprive the gut and the liver of blood flow, that will interfere with the cycle by both damaging the tissue but also you're not delivering the precursor molecules to the pathway. Cardiopulmonary bypass, which is sort of an induced or an iatrogenic form of hypoxia and shock, actually has huge damaging effects on both the liver and the uh, intestinal blood vessels, which actually will significantly affect these functions as well. And then anything that results in vascular bypass, either on purpose or by scarring down the liver so you can no longer pump blood through it, uh, will affect uh, urea cycle function. So what are the rare disease um, features of this teacher? So if I have a genetic defect uh, in a urea cycle, what, what's going to happen to me? Well, a couple of things. One is you can't clear ammonia. So if I completely take out your urea cycle, all of a sudden you can't clear ammonia, ammonia builds up, and as my mom used to say, anything you can use as a floor cleaner is not good for your brain. So you get cerebral edema, and a lot of patients die from that. The other thing is you don't produce your urea. And remember, urea is used as a concentrating agent in the kidneys. It's used in those very tricky glomerular filtration rates and things like that. So you actually lose some of that. Um, also, you don't produce arginine. In fact, when we first started treating urea cycle defects, we didn't really know this back in the early days. And we lost some patients because they kept having persistent hyperaminemia, persistent catabolism of their protein. And what we found is not only did we have to treat the hyper Aminemia, we actually had to replace the arginine that they could not make. So otherwise, arginine becomes an essential amino acid. The other thing we found is it can't produce citrulline. And we'll kind of talk about why that's important in just a little bit. Because like um, in real estate, in biochemistry, location is important. And we'll talk about what that means. 
And we've actually developed strategies over the years to deal with this for our patients with complex urea cycle disorders. We can clear ammonia. We have scavenging molecules that we can use to pull out some of the nitrogen precursors. Um, we can give patients arginine, which will not only supply their arginine, but also help them generate some urea. Um, we'd use different strategies depending on where we are in the pathway. So common things in the urea cycle. So what lessons can we learn from the environmental world? So common variants with functional effects. So first, let's talk about what are the environments we've been looking at over the years. And we're going to focus on cardiopulmonary bypass today. But a number, extreme prematurity, most of your nitrogen metabolism systems are not up to speed then, so very little babies don't make a lot of uh, citrulline and arginine, and that can be a real issue for them. High-dose chemotherapy we already talked about before, and besides the direct effects of cyclophosphamide, which breaks down to a compound called acrolein, or acrolein, depending on how you want to pronounce it, there are a number of other toxic effects on the liver, some of the hepatic venal occlusive disease things, relate directly back to some of the effects of high-dose chemo on the urea cycle. Um, ARDS, acute um, or adult or acute respiratory distress syndrome, has some interesting ties that we found back into this same pathway here. So these, this is another environmental extreme, particularly in the elderly. And then cardiopulmonary bypass. Now, we focused a lot of our time on uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. Why? You know, look at these four scenarios here. They're all pretty common. Well, if you think about it, the one that has the most controlled environment is actually the picture that looks the messiest. Um, surgeons are creatures of habit. Anesthesiologists are creatures of sleep and habit. But they always try to do things the same way. So even though the patients may have complex defects, they may have, be somewhat ill, they're typically going to be under more predictable circumstances than others. So by controlling the number of variables, this was actually a very good model of high environmental stress where we could actually start to uncover some genetic effects. So a couple of questions you should be asking right about now, and the answer is you can pretty much guess since I'm actually giving this talk. Are there common genetic changes in the urea cycle that affect functions? Absolutely there are. There's a common polymorphism in the first enzyme in the pathway that when we express that enzyme gives you maybe a 30% um, functional variation in how well it does. So there's definitely one. It's about a 45% heterozygosity in the U.S. And there's variations in all the others, too. We haven't characterized them quite as well, but they're definitely out there. Um, does the CPS enzyme have those changes? Yes, it does. So what you've got now is you've got something fairly common in the population that gives you a built-in variation in how efficient that urea cycle is in both clearing ammonia, but also, more importantly, in producing arginine and citrulline when we come to our environmental causes. So. Let's meet nitric oxide. Um, as of 9.30, there were about 124,000 articles on nitric oxide. I tend to view our scientific understanding of things using an inverse law. So the more articles that are published on something, the less understanding we actually have of what is going on with that. So since there's only 5,000 articles on the urea cycle in PubMed, that means we understand it much better than we do nitric oxide. And actually, from a practical standpoint, there's a lot of truth to that. So what does it do? It does a lot of things. Um, for our purposes, we're going to talk mostly about its vasodilator properties, but it's also a signaling molecule. It's a relaxer, which is part of its vasodilation. It's in the brain, muscle, vasculature, everywhere. Some things to remember about it is that nitric oxide has a half-life of about 20 milliseconds. So it is a very local phenomenon. It's released locally, and then it acts locally. So how do you make nitric oxide? Well. Remember I showed you on that urea cycle earlier that in the middle of the pathway you can actually bridge back around by throwing in nitric oxide synthase. It takes arginine, strips out a nitric oxide, um, and then it returns citrulline and that can spin around. Now, what you need to remember is a couple of things. One, that system is very leaky. Arginine can get rerouted to a number of places. Probably less than 10% of your total body arginine actually ends up playing uh, in nitric oxide. And within the cell itself, arginine can get routed to a number of places. It can go into building new proteins. It can be used to make polyamines, proline, creatine, um, and, and actually just has transport back and forth in and out. So um, it's a leaky system that needs new input. And we'll talk about what kind of new inputs we've got. But there's something else I want you to remember. One common mistake uh, that folks make when they start talking about nitric oxide synthase is they think if there's a problem, it's just about whether or not you're making nitric oxide. It's actually more complex than that. So the nitric oxide synthases are a dimer. Um, they actually, and I've got you a nice little picture here. 
As long as arginine is in the pocket of this enzyme, it stays dimerized. However, when there's nothing in that pocket, it actually falls apart. And then, okay, big deal. So you don't make nitric oxide. How's that different from if you uh, had another problem? Well, the problem is, is the enzyme actually doesn't completely shut off. It actually becomes a free uh, radical generator. So it makes peroxynitrites, uh, sort of ONOs, for those of you who like that kind of field work in um, oxidant uh, molecules and things like that. So it's not so much that it's an off-on, it's making nitric oxide or it's making something you don't necessarily want. So kind of keep that in mind. All right, so this is Dr. Richard Jonas, one of our lead cardiac surgeons here at Children's, doing hideously complex things to a very small heart. Um, we started this project with Rick Barr and a number of my other colleagues at Vanderbilt back in 2000. So we've spent years and years doing this, and we've looked at probably over 700 patients now undergoing cardiac surgery, uh, looking at some of the things I'm about to describe to you. So let's kind of roll back on cardiac surgery. Uh, it's an extremely stressful environment. Uh, there's hypoxia, vascular damage. You're put on cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, we know that that does cause damage to both the liver and the vascular endothelial and the gut. The conditions, however, are pretty controlled. They tend to do these things the same way. However, given that, about 25 to 35% of patients will develop the complication of post-cardiac surgery pulmonary hypertension. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's also a couple of things. First off, it means it's much harder for that heart that you've just cut open to pump blood through the lungs. Oxygen delivery is compromised. Um, and number of issues, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but it's actually one of the biggest causes of death after cardiac surgery. And you ask how many surgeries are done per year in the U.S.? About 20 to 25,000 for congenital heart disease. Now, it's interesting, the same model will probably hold in adult cardiac surgery. We just haven't done it yet, because with the kids, we're a much easier model to work with, and I'm a pediatrician, so we work with kids. So now, look at this slide. So what happens um, to citrulline and arginine levels uh, before and after cardiac surgery. Well, as you can see, they all take a pretty precipitous drop, and in about 12 hours afterwards, you've really significantly come down from your pre-op levels. And what we found is this is true for every single patient. Now, for some of our patients, um, there's some genetics involved, but also I'll show you a slide in the lower right-hand corner. It's going to be kind of interesting. And you see this is true for both citrulline and arginine. Well, you should be saying to yourself, now, look, Urea cycle doesn't work because uh, the patients aren't being fed, they're not getting protein coming in, so there's no need to run it. Interestingly enough, it's, that's really not the answer. When we look at all of the other amino acids, they're actually fine. It really is limited to that flow through the urea cycle for citrulline and arginine, and we think that's primarily because you've shunted blood away from the gut, so you're not using that biosynthetic pathway, and you further compromised it by shunting some blood away from the liver as well, too. Now, Ammonias don't go up. They bounce around a little bit in these patients, but they don't ever significantly go up. It's more the biosynthetic pathways downstream. One of the, one of the things we started looking at is we noticed that actually the patients who went on to develop pulmonary hypertension and those who did not in that lower right-hand graph, that we start to see significant differences in the citrulline at the different time points after surgery. So now let's play genetics because I am a geneticist. So next we started looking at we've got that polymorphism in the CPS1 gene, and remember that rate-limiting enzyme in the front. There's a polymorphism there called T1405N. Um, so T is actually the conserved residue. If you go back uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, that actually that T goes all the way back to rock pretty much. There's bacterial versions of the enzyme with this, and it's right smack dab in the middle of the cofactor binding domain. So actually when we first found this polymorphism back in 1992 when most of y'all were in high school or kindergarten or wherever, um, we actually uh, thought it was one that had killed a patient we were looking at. And I had a colleague who was a very good biochemist who looked at this and predicted that this would raise all kinds of hell on enzymatic activity and was surely why this patient died. And we finally worked out the rest of the structure of the gene and found out that actually about 45% of the population carried that change. And since CPS1 deficiency wasn't the most common cause of death on the planet, um, we figured it was just a polymorphism, but it always stuck with us that it might have some functional significance. So what do we find? Well, when we looked at the risk factors uh, for pulmonary hypertension after cardiac surgery, uh, we looked at age. That really wasn't much of a factor. Bypass time, you would have thought that would have popped up. It really didn't. Down syndrome actually is a huge risk factor, and there's an interesting story around nitric oxide that I'll save as a teaser for another day. 
Uh, it has to do with the Fenton reaction and all kinds of fun things there. But when we looked at our uh, CPS polymorphism, it was actually a great predictor of post-op pulmonary hypertension. For those of you who have done your biostats already, you will notice that our confidence interval does not cross one, uh, which was kind of a nice thing. And it's about a five to six fold increase risk factor for developing something that has a 25 to 30 percent attack rate. So that's actually a pretty big deal. Now, here's where this kind of gets more fun. So what I've done right now is what most of my colleagues in genetics classically do. We do association studies. We come along and we find a relationship between a gene and a phenotype, and then we run on to the next gene as fast as we can because it's really hard to figure out what to do about this. But this situation was a little bit different. We actually know a lot about how to fix urea cycle problems and how to supplement them. We know, for instance, you can add citrulline and arginine back into a system. So we thought, okay, let's take a look at this. So your obvious answer is, why don't you just give these patients arginine? And you know, people have been giving arginine to patients since the late 90s. Uh, there were heart bars, all kinds of things that were going to fix all kinds of cardiovascular disease, and they didn't work at all. And why? Well, if you think about it, you actually got to think of, again, about location and location. Most enzyme systems like to work in complexes. So the picture here I've got of an assembly line on a factory is very similar. If I just put those people scattered all over the room, it'd be very hard for them to ever be able to build what they're building. It's just be hard for them to do. But by putting them together like this and passing one piece off to the next, it becomes much more efficient. And this is kind of contra to the way most of us think of biochemistry is a big old bowl of water with some reactants in it that you shake up and things happen by brownie in motion, like the goldfish in the top. But actually what we find is enzyme complexes are quite common. And what we found is, sure enough, there's an enzyme complex here. So we did some a lot of immunoprecipitation experiments and a lot of other uh, isotope probes. And what we found is the three enzymes, ASS, ASL, and endothelial nitric oxide synthase, sit on their Lego bed of heat shock protein 90 and actually substrate channels, so they hand things off to each other. So one of the things we found is we can actually add a lot of arginine or a lot of arginine or succinic acid to a cell. Doesn't really seem to care. It doesn't really want to make much more nitric oxide or anything else. I can jam enough in there to make it happen, but you really have to work at it to make it happen. So these enzymes actually substrate channel. What's kind of fun is in different tissues, you get different enzyme complexes depending on what the purpose is for what you're trying to do. So citrulline actually is the entry point. And considering citrulline gets made in the mitochondria and exported into the cytoplasm, it's kind of a natural break point in the process. So citrulline is, circulates in the plasma. It gets imported by a neutral amino acid transporter. We've actually found that if you block that transporter, you can affect uh, nitric oxide production, and that also defects in ASS and ASL will also blunt nitric oxide production. So you can kind of do a Cox postulate here where if you knock these things out, you have an effect on the system. If you restore them, it goes better. So let's think about our model here for a rare disease or a rare disease, what our rare disease has taught us was common. Let's say your patient's stressed, cardiopulmonary, number of other things. So now you've also got things that influence the biosynthetic ability of the urea cycle, which decreases your citrulline and arginine. If you can make enough citrulline, if you've got enough floating around, you're okay. You can keep your nitric oxide synthase coupled, and you can keep your nitric oxide production up. So you don't really have the problems associated. But we found a lot of our patients, um, particularly some of the ones that are a little sicker, things like that, can't quite make enough citrulline. Either the bypass had a more significant effect, they've got the wrong CPS1 allele, take your pick. So two things happen. One, they can't make enough nitric oxide, so they lose some of their vascular dilation, hence the pulmonary hypertension after cardiac surgery. Or they uncouple their nitric oxide synthase, which results in oxidant injury and further inflammation, and actually a vicious loop that can spiral down very quickly. Well, how do we know that the nitric oxide is responsible for the vascular dilation being lost? Well, the treatment for it is actually nitric oxide gas, which will read, um, dilate the blood vessels and actually restore normal function. The problem with that is, is the second you turn off the gas, you've got a 20 millisecond period before everything goes away. So there's a lot of rebound from that. So we decided to play with this some. So we looked at nitric oxide production in both uh, in pulmonary artillery, uh, pulmonary artery endothelial cells, and we measured direct nitric oxide gas production. So if those of you who've done this sort of thing before, most of the nitric oxide data you're going to see is indirect from nitrates and nitrites because it does have that short half-life. 
this is one where you can actually directly look at the gas. And we found some things, one that was reassuring and then one that kind of confirmed what we're talking about. The amount of citrulline on a control um, cell line just living in happy oxygen content and not stressed doesn't really change anything because actually one thing you don't want is you don't want to add something in and suddenly have it affect uh, blood pressure radically. So NO was maintained. Now, in our hypoxic cells, um, we found that everything else being the same, their ability to make nitric oxide under stimulus was severely compromised to the point where, you know, it's almost a third of what it is in the control cells. What we found is we can restore most of that activity, enough so that you get the normal physiologic reactions by adding citrulline back into those cells as we're treating them. So the hypothesis here is kind of what we thought, not enough citrulline. Citrulline means not enough arginine, which means not enough production of nitric oxide here. And remember how we talked about the coupling of the enzyme earlier. On this slide, what we found is under hypoxic conditions in that first lane there, you see it's uncoupled. So you've now got the nitric oxide synthase monomer showing up. Under normoxic conditions, you don't see it. And normoxia plus citrulline, nothing really changes there because it's already coupled up. When we look at our hypoxic cells, they're almost mostly uncoupled here. We add citrulline back in, and then over about an hour or a couple hours, you've actually taken almost all of the uncoupled nitric oxide synthase back into its coupled format in an in vitro setting. Now, remember, that's the thing I always drives me a little crazy about in vitro uh, studies like that because you've kind of taken everything out of the milieu, but it's the best we got here. When we look at a whole organ model um, and we look at bronchopulmonary dysplasia models in piglets with uh, hypoxic uh, and then looking at pulmonary vascular resistance, we actually find that in our control animal, pulmonary artery pressure is pretty normal. We make them hypoxic, it goes way up. If we add the citrulline back in, we actually recover back towards normal and back into a physiologic normal range. We look at pulmonary vascular resistance, we see the same thing. And we've done a ton of experiments, but I've only got about 45 minutes to an hour with you guys, so I want to be careful about my time here. But if you want more information, most of this is published out there in the literature. We've got a fair number of things out there we can show you on this. I can also tell you we did the same experiment with arginine and did not see this effect. So what's the advantage to treating a patient or trying to prevent post-op pulmonary hypertension? Like I said, the current treatment's reactive. You add nitric oxide gas, but that tends to have a lot of rebound. Um, the prolonged hypoxia and post-cardiac stress on a patient that's just undergone significant surgery is really thought to be damaging. A lot of the new neurocognitive research in patients undergoing cardiac surgery says that this is a real stress on the brain. You get a significant increase in the pulmonary hypertension patients in measures of oxidant injury, significant increase in time on ventilator, it's threefold longer, uh, increased length of hospital stay, increased mortality, it goes from about 1.4% to about 6.2%, um, increased right ventricular strain, which can also lead to some lung things. Like I said, we just don't know what the long-term effects on the brain, but we think they're not very good. So. First thing we tried was oral citrulline. We thought, okay, we're going to load the patients up with citrulline before surgery and see what happens. What we found is that citrulline is horribly absorbed from the gut. Most of your circulating citrulline, pretty much all of it, comes from your own biosynthetics. And the gut bacteria and the, vas and the endothelium in the gut just don't absorb it that well. But the patients who did absorb it well enough to get their levels up above the 95th percentile of normal, Actually, none of them develop pulmonary hypertension. Uh, Heidi Beverly Smith, seen in the picture here, uh, that's Rick Barr, my colleague from Vanderbilt. And the most valuable person in this picture is actually my nurse on the left here, Jerry Rice. The key to good clinical research, and if anyone hadn't told you this, you need to remember this, is actually having a good study coordinator and good clinical research nurse. They're worth their weight in platinum or whatever is more valuable than that. But what we found is that um, the patients who did absorb enough citrulline to rise their levels did not develop pulmonary hypertension. So we thought that's interesting, but it also means we've got to do it a little differently. So we went to an IV model, and we had to develop an entire PK model around how much citrulline do you give. And what it ends up doing is you give them a bolus, and then you give them a steady infusion, and that usually does the job. Now, I'll tell you a cautionary tale in a second, but let me go through this data here. So the upper left graph, Fortunately, shows that when you give citrulline, citrulline levels go up. Yay. Gosh, that would have been disappointing if it didn't work that way. Arginine levels go up as well because some of it gets converted into kidney and the liver into arginine and elsewhere and probably a little bit in the gut as well too. 
your plasma nitric oxide though goes up almost immediately. And this one's the measures of nitrates and nitrites because we couldn't do direct gas in humans. So these were kids undergoing cardiac surgery who we gave uh, IV citrulline to. Now what's interesting is we have as yet really to observe a um, adverse event from giving this. I worried a little bit we'd see uh, drops in blood pressure, things like that. We actually did not see those at all. So this has proved to be pretty safe. So at this point, I, sh I need to do what I should have done on slide one, which is tell you I do have a conflict of interest here. Uh, Vanderbilt University holds the patent rights in my name uh, for the use of citrulline in cardiac surgery. It was licensed out to a company, and it's actually now in its final phase three FDA trial. None of you can really affect that, but um, I, you need to know that I actually do have an interest if this works out. Yay, raw for Vanderbilt. Um, and I'm at Children's National, which is not Vanderbilt. So now we'll go to the next slide. So what was the effect of this? So one of the things that came up, and this is a really interesting question we see, is what is a good marker for efficacy here? So it turns out we can actually do away with pulmonary hypertension. The patients we did that PK trial on, there's about 23 of them, only two of the ones who got the citrulline developed pulmonary hypertension. Of interest, those two patients both had Down syndrome. That tells you, that's about that other story I'll tell you about someday. But when we went to the FDA and said, hey, how would this be as an endpoint? They said, well, that's nice. That's a physiologic measure. You need to give us something else. Um, and they said, well, what about time in the ICU? Well, the time when you get discharged from an ICU has to do with how busy the ICU is and how many people are waiting in the hallway and when the shift changes. So even though we thought that might work, we kind of wanted to shy away from that. So. We want a ventilator time, which has got a ton of variables in it because it depends on who's running the ventilator, <coughs> how comfortable they are extubating the patient, et cetera, et cetera. But we went ahead and took the plunge anyway, pulled up uh, respiratory support time for these patients. And what we found is about a 75% drop in ventilator time for these patients postoperatively. In fact, about half of them were getting extubated uh, in the OR, which was kind of a neat thing to see. And I plotted it out on a survival curve for you here, the blue line being our patients who got uh, placebo, and then the uh, purple line being our patients with citrulline, and the survival distribution is how long they were on uh, ventilator time. So you can see there's a pretty significant uh, drop off from that, and this has, been, this has been reproducible for us a number of places, and like I said, we're in our phase three right now. So what does this tell us? Okay, so we started off with patients with rare defects in the urea cycle. Well, and we noticed in those patients they couldn't make citrulline and arginine. There were some things that happened to them in the ICU that suggested nitric oxide might not be um, being made right. And then we thought, okay, what other diseases? So we went out looking and we tumbled across a couple, a couple of them, one of which is this post op pulmonary hypertension. We knew we could replace citrulline and arginine in these patients. It turns out citrulline was the right thing to replace with rather than arginine, and we've now used that to develop a therapy for these patients. So this is sort of uh, been bed to bench back to a different bed um, as far as these sorts of things go. But you know, you're thinking to yourself, okay, wow, that sounds like an interesting thing for this rare and obscure disease field, but there's a lot of other places you can play with this. Think about urea cycle function in patients with cirrhosis. <coughs> they all have compromise there. Lessons we've learned from rare disease actually may benefit those patients homocysteinuria and rare defects in homocysteine metabolism and blood clotting. We actually already know that that plays a role. Uh, rare defects in glutathione metabolism in patients with stroke and heart attack. Fatty acid oxidation defects in fatty liver disease. There's some real nice links there. Um, the metabolism of phenylalanine or PKU and dopamine production in the brain and Parkinson's disease. There's some links there. Uh, BH4 metabolism, tetrahydrobiopterin, and everything going on in the liver, brain, heart, and lungs, because BH4 is involved in a lot of different things. Organic acidemias and high-dose chemotherapy, because a high dose, a lot of the chemotherapeutic agents look just like organic acids and chemically behave the same, and we can learn some things from the crossovers. And some of the biochemical markers you see are the same. H. pylori metabolism in urea cycle. H. pylori makes uh, urease, and that actually has impact on urea cycle patients. So there you're going from common back to rare. And then amino acid transport and cancer. People have been playing with trying to deprive cells of different amino acids for years. People have been playing with trying to get rid of arginine to see if you can kill off cancer cells. 
people play with glutamine metabolism, things like that as ways to kill off cancer cells. And all of these things can kind of come back and forth. So my take-home lesson to you would be that if you're looking at a rare disease, stop a second and think and say, okay, if I dialed the genetics on this way back so that I just had a little bit of effect on this system, what are some common medical conditions or common environmental conditions where I might actually recreate this? The nice thing about that is while you may not be able to successfully completely cure your rare disease patient, what you learn about taking care of them can often go back to helping your less common patient out. So that's really kind of all I've got for you today. Um, let me turn to Deb here and see if there's anything else she wants me to talk about. I'm going to put her on speaker now. Well, the one thing I, I want you to mention in brief, at least in most other people have questions, but I wanted to ask the question, um, tell us a little bit about why you chose rare disease and how you created that into a career for yourself. Just briefly a little bit about that. Okay. I started off in molecular biology in the 1970s, and almost everything we learned about molecular biology and mechanisms in humans, we learned from a rare disease model in humans or in animals. So. For me, actually going into that field, there really wasn't anything else to say but rare disease. And what I, I really fell in love with it because each one of them was a puzzle. The diseases significantly impact these families. These were people who really needed folks focusing on that field. And you know, the, the puzzling aspects of it, sort of the puzzle solving aspects, the tie into molecular biology and our basic understanding of cellular metabolism by these sort of, I hate to say these experiments of nature and then just the, the overwhelming uh, families, these folks that just would welcome you into their lives, would treat you like um, you were just a member of their family. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually very humbling in that regard. It's, it was a hard field not to go into. So a lot of um, people say it's so frustrating because NIH funding is so tight and it's so hard to you know, compete for funding. Do you want to not give the full details, but how have you dealt with funding and how is it well, unique and how you've approached life? So first let's talk about NIH's devotion to rare disease. Um, one thing I can tell you is the folks at NCATS love rare disease. About 12% of NIH funding is currently going to rare disease studies, some in cancer, some in other areas, and that's actually by the NIH's own statistics. NIH got a $2 billion bump last year. So if you come in with good proposals, um, you're going to be pretty warmly received. And just remember, too, when you're presenting something to the NIH around a rare disease, try to make that tie back to a common disease. They love that. It makes, it's a very popular sentiment from uh, them, and it's something that they can get their teeth around. Not only is this going to help maybe the five to ten patients with this disease, but we may learn something crucial for taking care of literally millions of patients. The other thing, too, though, is lift your head up and look around. The NIH is not the only game in town. I've been for particularly lucky. One of the things we did at Vanderbilt is when we um, licensed out the citrulline stuff, but rather than trying to take payouts or anything, what we did is we actually had the company that licensed it do an unrestricted research gift account every month uh, back to the laboratory. And that's been worth many millions of dollars since that time and allowed us to go in and do our next series of projects. Now, like everything else, you've got to make sure you manage your conflicts of interest in those things, and, but there's pretty good ways to do that in sunshine is always your friend there. Um, the other th group you'll work with are patient and family organizations. Some of them will fund cystic fibrosis is a wonderful example of success for that. Uh, CF uh, has generated hundreds of millions of dollars, actually $3 billion through their research into uh, drugs for affecting cystic fibrosis, and they've done it partnering with both the patients and the research community. So I would actually say the opposite is true. I think there are more opportunities for doing research in rare disease than there are in common, given its um, impact on the population. Uh, the other thing to remember is uh, about 50% of the drugs being developed out of FDA now are for rare disease. Now, the number of patients those are treating are disproportionately smaller, but the actual number of compounds coming through are right at about 50% from FDA for rare disease now. So it's a great time to be in the water. Anyone have a question that you want to avoid? I have one here from Peter who typed in, but any other questions before I read Peter's? So Peter asks, what are some ways to identify opportunities for translational research or clinical studies? Sorry, again? 
what are some ways to identify opportunities for translational research or clinical studies? Well, part of that is always have your curiosity with you when you're looking at a patient. Um, if a patient does something that's unexpected or out of the norm and you kind of know what their underlying molecular defect is, you should always be thinking, does this tie in with this? Is there something where there was a combination of environment and this patient's rare disease that may have led to this? Uh, there's an old phrase that calls, you know, the most interesting dog is the one that doesn't bark. Why do some patients get a complication and others don't? I mean, take Down syndrome, for instance. 50% of patients don't get congenital heart disease. Why don't they? Why don't they all get it? Um, you know, uh, I think 10 to 15% of them get hypothyroidism. Why don't they all get it? So these are patients that have a significant genetic impingement on their system, and yet they do sometimes get a complication and sometimes they don't. And those are the interesting ones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, our, our next call-in is by Mark Batshaw. He's going to talk more about how do you leverage that comparison to the common and the uncommon, too. And some of the things you talked about are creative funding sources. He's actually going to talk about how he created um, kind of his own funding in his life experience. Oh, yeah, Mark. Experience. I mean, Mark is a, one of the best examples I know of of where working with families and patients can lead to, uh, you know, lead to actually doing things. Now, I'm going to throw in a little bit of an editorial here, if that's okay, Deb. You know you can. He's my co-PI. He can say whatever he wants. Okay. Yeah. The, with the editorial I'm going to throw in here, if you're doing any particular field of research, yes, no bucks, no buck Rogers. If there's nobody's paying for it, you can't do it. But... The other thing is don't pick the field that you put your heart into and your soul just because it can be funded. Pick the thing that you think is going to make a difference. Pick the thing that you really think is going to engage you creatively, intellectually, and also at your emotional level as well, too. And I see so many people, particularly when they're starting out, well, I went into this because I thought it could get funded. So, you know, when it was time to do whole exome, I did whole exome. When it was time to do... Genome, I was doing genome. When it was time to do differential display, I did that. And they really chase where the funding is rather than where their heart is. And I've seen very few researchers go wrong by working on something that to them they thought was important, to them they thought was meaningful, and they thought was interesting. Uh, and Because it, it that's going to show in your grant applications too. It's going to show that that's something that means something to you. And believe it or not, that's worth points. And then in our last two minutes, I want two minutes on how did you um, create work-life balance for yourself in the <laughs> middle of all this? Is there such a thing, or is that all a farce, or what do you think? Oh, Lord, I think you just asked the, the two, $20 million No, question? I was going to say it about the $20 trillion yes. question. Um, that's the hardest part of all this. You're supposed to, and I don't know how many of you out there are women, how many of you are men, how many of you have families, how many of you are single parents. Um, and I suspect maybe it's a mix of all of the above. We are still living in a model that has been dead now for about the last 20 years. Uh, when I started off in the field, um, you know, it was typically a uh, guy was working, family at home, and the salary was to bring it home. And I have some wonderful female colleagues from that age who are pillars of iron, my wife being one of them. Um, but that was the model that everyone worked with. And then we did what we should have done a long time ago, which is we then got everyone involved in the field. And, but we didn't change the model. You were expected to do these crazy hours with demands to be the triple threat, to be the teacher, the physician, and um, you know, the scientist. And then, of course, the electronic medical record, because we all know how much time that saved us, um, suddenly you know, how do you do all these things, work till 8 o'clock at night and maintain any kind of balance? I don't have a great answer for you, to be honest. Um, I've done things like raise kids by myself, and I know how tough that can be. I think probably what you've got to do is you have to have realistic expectations. And those are going to come more from yourself than from old um, guys like me, because we don't get it by and large. If you kind of sit us around and you say, oh, what's mentoring and what's that? We're going to talk about, well, I taught you how to write a grant. And I taught you where to publish and, you know, got your science off and going like that. And 
we don't even address the facts of, well, how are you going to do that and still make the pickup for the kids from daycare before you start getting charged a dollar a minute for being late for that when you're trying to run an experiment with mice who don't really care about the time too much. And we've got to really relook at this. We've got to look at how do we make it so that people can stay in the field, people can survive in the field, and people can thrive in the field. And that's going to require a serious rethink. So hopefully all of you heard from Marshall Summer that if you're feeling that it's sometimes hard to balance your whole life, you're in good company. Is that fair, Marshall? I'd say you're in 90% company. Yeah. So just once, I, I think that he's one of those people that can say that in a really eloquent way. So thank you for saying that for all of us. Thanks. And um, I really appreciate all of you being in the program. Deb says I'm her co-I, but let's be really honest here. This is Deb's program she does a terrific job with. And I hope all of you enjoyed the NORD meeting. We certainly enjoyed having you there. And I look forward to seeing some of you all in person in the future. As always, we're recording this, and we'll see you in a few weeks. So we am here from Mark Batshaw. Thanks so much for joining in. Call, text, email if you have any questions in the interim. Thanks, all. Have a great January. Thanks. You too. Thanks. Bye.